Okay guys, Timmy coming at you here. And uh, today, what I want to do is, I made a video on digestion. So I took you from the mouth all the way to making poop. What I want to do now is concentrate a little bit on the accessory organs of digestion. So you got your big three, right? You got your liver. The liver sits in the right upper quadrant. And then right below the liver is this guy right here, the gallbladder. And then hanging out behind the stomach is the pancreas. Now, what I want to do first is I want to talk to you about the liver. And I want to talk to you about some of the functions of the liver. First of all, number one, very important. all the blood, all the venous blood, venous blood of your GI tract all of that all of that venous blood that contains your digested carbs, fats, protein electrolytes, all that stuff. As you can see, all the veins of the GI tract meet and come together at what is called the hepatic portal vein. So a portal circulation is where two capillary beds meet without having to go through the heart. So the liver has a portal circulation. So all of your digested nutrients that got absorbed into the blood get absorbed into the venous end of your GI tract so all of the fats carbs amino acids right electrolytes they go to the liver first so everything essentially that you put into your pie hole has to go through the liver first. So the liver is loaded with enzymes that detoxify stuff, that break stuff down, that make it less harmful to the body. So when you get into clinical, they're going to refer to the first pass. So the first pass of a medication goes through the liver on the way in, but it also goes through the liver on the way out. So if somebody's in liver failure, and this is very important, when an organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. So one of the functions of the liver is to detoxify harmful chemicals that may try to enter your central circulation. So um, if a person's in liver failure, then small amounts of medication will end up in their bloodstream and it'll be higher than normal because the liver's not functioning to detoxify it. So that's one of the big functions of the liver. And this is where previous learning is going to take effect. We learned that veins are thin wall. There's very little or no pressure in the veins and therefore their muscular wall is rather thin. So when all of that venous blood from the GI tract goes to the liver, one of the things that the liver does is it detoxifies stuff, right? It tries to make things less toxic before they enter the general circulation. So once it's gone through that process of detoxification and filtering, then you have a vessel called the hepatic vein. And then the hepatic vein takes what the liver cleaned up and then brings it into, dumps it into the central circulation, the inferior vena cava. So, as blood from your GI tract goes back to the liver, again, real quick, it's gonna detoxify stuff. That's one big function of the liver. The other big function of the liver is to make this stuff called bile. So bile is made in the liver 
and then gets stored in the gallbladder. And by definition, a bladder is a hollow muscular organ, and its function is to store this bile and then release it into the duodenum when it's needed. And it's really needed to kind of break up fat. It's kind of the dawn dish detergent of the body. It gets grease out of your way. But let me first talk to you about how bile is formed. Now, the only thing that you'll probably ever remember from this class is that red blood cells live 120 days. And there's a protein inside that red blood cell called hemoglobin. And embedded in the heme portion of the hemoglobin is iron. And we know there's each hemoglobin molecule has four irons, but I'm tired, so I'm going to drown one. Now, what, they live about 120 days, roughly. And when they die, there's three places that they can go. They can go to the liver. They can go to the spleen. The spleen has a huge part in getting rid of old, worn-out red blood cells. And then the reticuloendothelial complex. And basically, that's a series of enzymes located in the capillaries of around cells that will degrade and get rid of old red blood cells. So let's talk about that. So basically what happens when an old red blood cell is about to die, can go to the liver, the spleen, or what I like to call the rectplex, right? And first thing that happens is the red blood cell membrane is ruptured and then it leaves this molecule of hemoglobin that has iron embedded in it. And then hemoglobin is going to get broken down to heme and uh, you're not going to believe it, globin. Globin is a medical term for um, protein. So globin, anytime you see globin, think protein. And then globin gets broken down to its constituents, which are, of course, amino acids. And then those amino acids go to the liver. The liver don't store a lot of amino acids, so those amino acids either get converted to fat or glucose. The heme portion is different. The heme portion, which contains iron, then gets broken down to the stuff called bilirubin and iron. So, and bilirubin has a yellowish color, so you see where I'm going with this, right? And then the bilirubin in your liver, right, the bilirubin, liver then gets converted to bile. Now, <clears throat> bile contains a couple of things, right? What makes up bile? Right? It has um, bilirubin in it. Right? It's got some cholesterol. got some bile salts and it's got a little little phospholipids so that's bile now you make the bile in the liver where you store it is in the gallbladder so once the bile is made, right, you make bile in the liver, and I'll show you this. As you can see, bile is formed in the liver. It's not stored there. It will then leave the liver through the common hepatic duct, and then it will, that bile will get stored in the gallbladder. So what the gallbladder really does is stores the bile and then it dehydrates it, removes water. So that's really the big function of the gallbladder. Now, 
remember that um, bilirubin has a yellowish color. So, and I also explained to you that when an organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. So, watch. If your liver is failing, are you going to still destroy red blood cells? Well, yeah. So, those red blood cells are going to get broken down to heme and globin, and then it's going to get converted to bilirubin and iron. And where does the bilirubin go? Well, we talked about this. The bilirubin then gets sent back to the liver and get converted to bile. The problem is, is that you're in liver failure. Your liver is not working. And again, when all when an organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. So bilirubin is not going to be able to be converted to bile fast enough because the liver's failing. So what's going to happen to the bilirubin? Well, the bilirubin is going to back up in the liver, then it's going to back up into the blood, right? The blood, and then it's going to back up into the tissues. And what color is bilirubin? It's yellow. So that's why one of the late signs of liver failure is people turning jaundice. So that's a big function, making bile. And the purpose of bile is to help you adequately digest fat. It kind of it emulsifies it, it breaks big fat globs into little fat globs, and that helps the enzymes that digest fat digest it more efficiently. So there was a drug called Allied out a while back, I don't even know if it still is, but basically that was a bile acid sequestrant. It prevented bile from emulsifying fat. And if you can't break big fat globs into little fat globs, then you have a hard time digesting it. And if you can't digest fat, then you can't absorb it and get it into the central circulation. And if you can't get it into the central circulation, it can't be stored in fat cells and make you tubby. So what happened to that fat if you took that, um, what was it called again? Um, I forgot, but who cares? Um, that, that type of weight loss would cause people to have uh, steatorrhea or fatty poop. You don't want that. That stuff stinks. Poop stinks. You should write that down. <clears throat> Anyways, so that's one of the big functions of the liver. The other function of the liver, which is important, right, is it makes the big protein in your blood albumin. So, I hate to do this to you, but if you recall from previous learning, the two big things in your blood that determine capillary osmotic pressure are sodium and albumin. Big L. Right? So, if when the liver fails, all the functions of that liver fail. So, the ability to make albumin and dump it into the blood is going to be impaired. The result is, is that the blood becomes hypotonic and it will cause fluid from the blood to move through the peritoneal membrane and give you a big belly. So people who are in liver failure, they develop ascites. And ascites is the result of uh, no or low, no or low albumin in the blood. And that right there is not a beer belly, that's actually fluid that accumulates and that's a, also kind of a late sign of liver failure. So what they do is they put a tapper on you, depending on what you drank, like this could be like Miller Lite or maybe like a, a old style. And they remove that fluid through what's called an amniocentesis and the fluid's going to reaccumulate. The only reason they do that is that that fluid pushes up on the diaphragm and this person can't breathe. So this is what's referred to as palliative, meaning it's just, it's not going to cure the person, it's simply to help the person breathe a little better. So that's another function of the liver, making 
that big protein albumin. Now, another really big function in the liver is to make clotting factors, blood clotting factors. The liver makes a bunch of blood clotting factors. So again, when the liver fails, all the functions of that organ fail. So these people lack essential clotting factors when they're in liver failure. So one of the things are, it's almost invariable. Invariably, they die from one of two reasons. They either go into what's called hepatic coma, or they develop a GI bleed and can't stop the bleeding. So let's take a look at these lack of blood clotting factors and why someone could develop a GI bleed. So if you look, again, when the liver fails, you have cirrhosis, right, scarring of the liver, let's say, and a large percentage of it. And normally, if you have about 70% of your liver gone, uh, you're going to need to get it on a liver transplant list or it's over for you. The liver is one unique organ. It is able to regenerate itself. But once you hit about 70% in terms of liver damage, it's pretty much officially over for you. So watch. The same amount of blood from the GI tract is trying to get back to the liver. But you have this scarring. And this scarring of the liver and reduced surface area of the liver is going to cause the liver not to be able to handle all that blood from the GI tract. The result is, is that it, it, that blood that normally would go to the liver and then enter the general circulation is going to get backed up and it's going to back up into the veins of the GI tract. And we learned that the veins of the GI tract have no pressure. So they're thin walled. So what happens, these people start getting, they start getting hemorrhoids, right? Anyone over the age of 40 who has a couple of drinks on a regular, they got hemorrhoids. The other thing is, is that they will start getting these ballooned out veins in their esophagus and they'll develop what's referred to as esophageal varices. Now watch. When, if your liver's working fine, you cut yourself, then the liver releases these blood clotting factors that cause your blood to clot. One of the functions of the liver is to make these essential blood clotting factors. But again, when the organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. So the ability to release and make these blood clotting factors is impaired in some with liver damage. So once these people start bleeding, right, they can't stop it. That's why they end up with these really nasty GI bleeds. And it's really not good. It's terrible. It stinks. So they're throwing up blood. They're crapping blood. And um, it's very difficult to stop for the reasons that the liver makes those clotting factors. So that's uh, another essential component of the liver, making those blood clotting factors. The other thing, though, again, previous learning, watch, the liver activates T4 into the more powerful T3, triiodothyronine. So again, when the organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. So these people in liver failure will develop hypothyroidism. So they'll be hypothyroid with liver failure. So people with liver, the hits just keep on coming. They're hypothyroid. Boom. All right. That's lovely. All right. Let's go back to my two curved lines in a circle to explain the next function of the liver. The next function of the liver deals with protein. So remember, everything that you put into your pie hole got to come back to the liver. So you got a liver cell here. How do you know it's a liver cell? I wrote liver cell. So it will take amino acids that you just ate. And remember, amino acids have this NH2 group, right? 
this NH2 group is called the amino group. And the amino group contains nitrogen. So those amino acids, when they go to the liver, if they're not going to be used inside cells to make protein, then the amino acid gets that amino group hacked off. Boom. And that amino group is then converted to ammonia. Ammonia is bad for you, right? It's toxic. So the body does stuff that makes sense. And it converts it to urea, which is water soluble and less toxic, and dumps it into the blood. And because it has nitrogen, nitrogen N, yeah, that's an N, right? Um, it's called blood urea nitrogen. So here's a little clinical stuff coming at you. If somebody is in liver failure and when an organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail, do you want them to be eating a lot of protein? No, right? Because ammonia will start building up. And if you, because you can't convert it to urea fast enough, so if ammonia starts building up in the blood, ammonia is able to cross the blood-brain barrier. So you got the blood, and then I'm going to make a blood-brain barrier. I'm going to make that white. Uh -huh. Well, wait. Eh, let's see. Make it this color. So you got the, you got the BBB, the blood-brain barrier. Boy. And then you've got your brain cells. Now remember, your brain, central nervous system, doesn't have a lymphatic system. So this ammonia can freely leave the blood, cross the blood-brain barrier, and enter into cells. So what you do is you cause the brain, now because you're adding that ammonia, to become hypertonic to the blood. You got more stuff because of the ammonia in the brain cell, and you got less stuff in the blood. So the blood now becomes hypotonic to the brain cells. And as we know, water always moves from an area of low osmolarity to high osmolarity. And that will cause your brain to swell. When your brain swells, cuts off blood flow, nerves don't work, it's good, and you go into a coma and you die. So people with liver failure, there's basically one of two ways that they end up taking a six foot dirt nap. It is either massive GI bleed or hepatic coma. Now, watch, I shouldn't even be telling you this. One of the things they'll give a patient is they'll give them lactulose. Lactulose, lactulose is fiber, it's not digestible. But what lactulose does is it draws the ammonia out of the blood and then they crap it out to try and lower their levels of ammonia in their blood because that ammonia is toxic. So that's another big function of the liver. It converts that amino group to ammonia, and then that ammonia to urea, all right? The other thing that the liver does is, as you know, it stores glycogen, right? Which is a stored form of glucose. And then it also, whoops, it also, um, helps activate uh, vitamin D, right? You have cholecalciferol produced in the skin, and then in the liver it's converted to 25 hydroxy choli cholecalciferol. Oh, yeah. Well, you know how to spell it. Cipherol. And 
again, <clears throat> when an organ fails, all of that fun all of the functions fail. So one of the things that it does is it begins to activate vitamin D. Once it makes that 25 hydroxycholecalciferol, it then gets dumped back into the blood and the kidney actually activates it into that 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol. But again, remember when the organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. So with liver failure, you can't activate or finally activate vitamin D because you're missing this middle step. The result is, is that they will have a low vitamin D and low vitamin D means they can't absorb calcium from the blood. So their bones will begin to thin. Plus they have all the signs and symptoms associated with low blood levels of calcium. Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, oh. gee whiz. Can't believe I almost forgot that. The liver manufactures cholesterol. So cholesterol is required to make hormones and cell membranes, right? And we know the different types of cholesterol. You got HDL, the happy cholesterol. You got LDL, the lousy cholesterol. And then you have BLDL, the very lousy cholesterol. So if you add those three guys up, then that's your total cholesterol. So when you go get a lipid panel, then um, you get your triglycerides, which is the amount of fat floating in your blood, and then your HDL, LDL, and BLDL, which tell you how much cholesterol is floating in the blood. Okay, another big function of liver is that it stores fat soluble vitamins. Right? And that's D, E, A, and K. So Vitamin K is also uh, critical for blood clotting. So if the liver fails and it can't store enough vitamin K, and the result is you're going to bleed. So bleeding is a real issue with people with liver disease. All right, that's pretty much the liver. Now let's concentrate on the gallbladder a little bit, but I wanna show you a different diagram because um, every once in a while, well, not every once in a while, a lot of times, but knowing a little anatomy really will help you out. So, if you look here, if you look, you got your liver, right? So here's the liver. And then you have the gallbladder, and then you have the pancreas right here. As you can see, the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct of the gallbladder come together to form the common bile duct. And then the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct come together at what's called the ampulla of Vader, or the hepatic pancreatic ampulla, right? And they all dump their contents into the duodenum. So because they're all connected. Anytime you have a problem with one organ, you will potentially have a problem with another uh, organ of these three guys. So pancreatic problems can lead to gallbladder and liver problems. Liver problems can lead to gallbladder and pancreatic problems. You get where I'm going with this. So again, the primary function of the gallbladder is basically twofold. One, the bile that is produced by the liver then travels through the common hepatic duct and then that bile gets stored in the gallbladder. And again, the gallbladder dehydrates it, so the concentration, how concentrated that bile is in the gallbladder compared to when it was leaving the liver, it's much more concentrated. That's why, because it's made of cholesterol and electrolytes, you can form these gallstones. And you'll learn in clinical that it's the um, five F's of gallbladder disease. Those five F's are um, female, fat, 40, 
fair skin. And fertile. Those are the five Fs. Now, are they right on the mark all the time? No, but again, this is just a general rule. And in the presence of fat in particular, because the bile helps emulsify the fat, when you get the fat in the duodenum after you ate like, I don't know, pizza, that's going to cause a hormone called CCK to be released from these cells of the GI tract right, the duodenal cells, and that CCK, cholecystokinin, is going to stimulate the gallbladder to contract, and it's going to squish that bile into the duodenum. Now, one of the things that can happen in, especially people that have gallstones, Sometimes those gallstones aren't that, aren't that big. So when the gallbladder contracts, it can get through the cystic duct, travel through the common bile duct, but then it gets stuck in this ampulla vader because you got that little circular band of muscle called the sphincter of Odi. So that gets stuck there. Okay, can't get bile in there. So typically people get right upper quadrant epigastric pain about half hour, 45 minutes after eating a meal, especially something that's high in fat. So the gallbladder is kind of trying to contract, squish that bile in there, but the stone is blocking it. Now, again, if you look here, the pancreatic duct and the cystic duct come together to form that ampulla, I'm, I'm sorry, not the cystic duct, the common bile duct, come together to form that ampulla of Vader. So, when there is food in the duodenum, the pancreas will release digestive enzymes. So if you look, look here. Oh yeah, you're going to look. Don't you wait. I think you're going to look. Where are you going to look? Hang on. I'm going to find it. All right, so watch. You got some food in here, some fatty food. Gallbladder is going to try and contract. When it does, it contracts and sends that little gallstone down the common bile duct and gets lodged by that sphincter of Odi. With food in the duodenum, that's going to stimulate the pancreas to release digestive enzymes to help digest that food. But where do those digestive enzymes that were produced by pancreatic cells want to go? They want to go into the duodenum. But there's a stone block in it. Enzymes are stupid. They are. I texted trypsin and I got nothing back. And I'm not even playing. So here, let's, let's so you get a reference. Right? Watch. I'm going to take cells of the pancreas. Here's the pancreatic duct, right? I'm going to blow them up on this little drawing that I tried to make. I'll show you what happens. So you got two types of cells. You got ductal cells, and then you have um, acinar cells. Ductal cells release bicarbonate. Acinar cells release these digestive enzymes. The bicarbonate is required to neutralize that acidic chyme, as I explained before. But they release enzymes amylase, lipase, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and nucleases. Right? So if you look, amylase, that digests carbs, lipase, fat, trypsin, and chymotrypsin protein. And you're not going to believe this, and I find this hard to believe. Guess what the cells of the pancreas are made out of? Yep, you got it. Carbs, fats, and protein. 
Now, where are those digestive enzymes that were released from those pancreatic cells supposed to go? Where are they supposed to go? They're supposed to go in the duodenum and digest your fruity pebbles or raviolios. But there's a gallstone block in it. So those digestive enzymes will remain in the pancreatic duct and they will ultimately do their job. And that is to digest fats, carbs, and protein. So it will begin to digest your pancreas. That's acute pancreatitis. So pancreatitis is actually destruction of your own pancreas by your own digestive enzymes. And the most common cause of acute pancreatitis is cholelithiasis and obstruction of the ampulla of <coughs> Vader. So look, how do you know somebody's got pancreatitis? Well, they come in, they got fever, they got belly pain, they're throwing up, life is not good watch this is old learning <laughs> here's a pancreatic cell how do you know it's a pancreatic cell I'm writing pancreatic cell so watch what do pancreatic cells release amylase lipase trypsin I'll keep going on but if your pancreatic cells are getting eaten and the cell membrane which contains carbs fats and protein is getting digested by amylase and lipase watch it your cell membrane of your pancreatic cell is going to be disintegrated and those enzymes amylase and lipase will go into the blood so one of the ways to determine the cause of abdominal pain is to look at amylase and lipase because the enzymes that are stored inside a cell, if the cell that has those enzymes is healthy, you won't find them in the blood. But if the cell, the cell membrane is ruptured, the enzymes that are supposed to be inside a healthy cell will now enter the blood. And the result is you will have an elevated amylase and lipase. That's how you know you got pancreatitis. So what do you do for people with pancreatitis? Well, watch. What caused the release of those digestive enzymes from the pancreas? Yep, you guessed it, food. So these people are NPO, NPO, nothing per us. They don't get to eat nothing, nothing. Because what caused the problem? Food in the duodenum. So, oh, you don't want them to eat and make it worse, right? Then you stick an NG tube down their stomach and suck out all the gastric contents because even stomach contents with no food in it, you get these peristaltic waves that will dump that acidic goo into your duodenum and that will stimulate the release of pancreatic enzymes and make it worse. Then you give them some anti-inflammatory, some pain medicine, some antibiotics, and you say a little prayer and hope they don't go septic and die. So that's the most common cause of acute pancreatitis and its treatment. So those are the big functions of the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas.